Thank you for listening to Mailbox Money, your guided tour through safe, sacred, and speculative investing with a plan and a purpose to do more good with newfound peace of mind. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mailbox Money. This is a continuance of our last discussion. Uh, The last episode, we talked a lot about am I going to be okay and how Ryan boiled a career's worth of knowledge and research reports into just two simple questions. So this episode, we're going to talk about the second question that he figured is the only other one that matters in, in all of this finance and returns and projections and all that. But I want to paint the picture here a little bit because he mentioned that he started his career in Wall Street in the mailroom. And then, you know, he's humble enough, he won't tell you, but he, he climbed the ladder. And in his last presentation to a room full of executives and top of the food chain here, he presented what he's about to talk about now to them. And I'd love, Ryan, if you just kind of walk us through the story, what you presented and what their reactions were and why you felt it was such a pivotal moment and, and why you did it because it was, you know, I'm sure it took some guts. I, I don't know how you felt prior to that, but probably like if Vander Holyfield walking into the ring with Mike Tyson, you know, didn't know he's going to get his ear bitten, but, uh, you know, like it occurs, it occurs to me, we may want to retitle this episode, how not to make friends <laughs> on Wall. I didn't make that many that day. I'm down to you. Um, and I couldn't be more glad. Um, and the last day I ever wore cufflinks, I think. That whole crowd and that whole show, um, <laughs> I, I, I have a more beat up uh, car now, which I love more. I mean, the whole, so I had a question. I, I, you know this, I'm not, I wasn't smarter than anybody in that room. I wasn't trying to figure out the next 30 years better and be a wizard. Um, I've learned the greatest trade in the world. And it took me a long time. Um, is when you want to get it right more than you want to be right. Um, and humility is the secret ingredient in this industry. So the, the presentation I made was um, questioning at that time my hero. So Peter Lynch, among others, had said, um, you don't really need any fixed income or bonds if the stock market is capable of returning and you fill in the blank. A lot of people like to say eight, nine, 10%, whatever their historical averages are. And they got that big Ibbotson chart on the wall. And over time it's smooth and you zoom in and it's like, well, actually that 30 years, (laughs) which is gonna be my life. If you zoom in, it's actually up and down quite a bit. So over time won't matter one bit and those odds when it's my time to retire and we have subsequently you and I together completely turned upside down and we're going to talk about it today why there's something much much better than retirement planning to begin with and why we call it freedom day but back then he and many others had said well if the market makes 10 percent you should be able to take out seven percent and they were trying to answer I mean those are the early days of financial planning as it exists kind of today in these late 90s when people realize you're not going to be able to just save up and live off interest. I mean, it used to be the answer to this question used to be how much is enough? You save a million dollars and you could live off one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in interest and T-bills. It was easy. The good old days. Then the question changed of how much is enough so that I can. Interest and principal or figure out and, and that's where financial planning really started as an industry. A lot of great attempts. So I, I said, wait a minute. You go 10% and you're taking out 7%. And I spotted this entire room, the actual math of, we used a 30 year period that we were right at the tail end of, where you actually in a 60, 30, 10 equities, bonds, cash, with all due respect to the all equity guys, um, an actual balance. I said, you actually did average over that 30 year period, about 10% and no funny math. That's net, no cost, no taxes to come out. And if you take out 7%, you make 10, you take out seven, How much would you guess your million dollars is worth at the end of the 30 years? 3 million, 13 million, all these different guesses. Um, And then I show the actual math, which is the only thing I'm good at. Um, And you're bankrupt in year 13. And it didn't matter how much you started with. 
Um, it didn't matter what the average rates of return over time were if early on you're withdrawing from something that's going down. Fast forward another 10 years and the safer withdrawal rate is now the current answer, which while it might not be quite as dangerous as pulling out 7% of your portfolio, with current interest rates, I would argue it's pretty darn close or a lot closer than people think. And I think it is the biggest unasked question and the biggest potential ticking time bomb for most plans that are with relying on pulling out principal and hoped for profits without hardly any interest rates to back them up. What if the market doesn't go anywhere for a long period of time? And it happens a lot more than bulls or bears who are arguing, is it going to go up or down? The day I got married, the market was at the same place 13 years later. Now, thankfully, and I keep that chart in the corner of my desk for a lot of reasons. Now, thankfully, she did not need to withdraw any funds or from me, thankfully. But had I retired that day and was pulling 4% a year and the bond market gives me risk-free 1.5% and the stock, it's not going to work. So our answer that we'll want to get into is how much is enough is not an asset number. And this is going to completely turn upside down everybody's, I hope, anybody's that wants to listen and learn the math. This is not an opinion. This is not a prediction. It's actually the opposite of prediction. We want to give just the thought process of it is multiple income streams. The answer isn't at what asset number I want to retire. It should be at what income number I can retire. And if you really want to jump in, the mindset that we've adopted in our playbook, it shouldn't be retirement age. It shouldn't be age related. If it's not an asset number, it could be early or later. It's at the number where your income exceeds your expenses. And we call that day when that happens, your freedom day. So I want to talk a little bit about, because I want to paint the picture on that 10% market return, 7% withdrawal rate. Most people would say, oh, positive 3% after my expenses, I'll compound at 3% for 30 years. But that's thinking in averages. And it's the one time that we think in averages when we shouldn't think in averages, because it doesn't matter what the average return over time is. It matters what your return is. So you said you're bankrupt in year three, so even, or in year 13, excuse me. So even though the average was 10% return from whatever year you started to 19, 2006 or whatever, um, it, it's what happens in the first few years that make or break these projections or predictions. So year one return had to have been lower than it might not even have been. It could have been higher. But what happens is your return isn't at 10 percent very often. So you were texting me and telling asking me and I got this way wrong. But you said how many you know, what's the project? What does everybody say is the average return of the market? Or Just to let the audience know who they're dealing with here and how smart Jackson Wood is, this is the only time <laughs> I've stumped. Well, and it's because this was so shocking. I've had this conversation and I, I know, I know the risk here. Like I, I know that, but I didn't know how, I don't even know what to say here. I didn't know how crazy the numbers were. So you said to me, what is the average prediction of what the market's going to return. And I think I said to you, I think most people say anywhere from eight to 12. And you said, yeah, that's pretty much the, the range that people will say. And you asked me in the last 121 years, how many times do you think the market has returned between eight and 12% in that? Eight, eight and 10. Eight and 10. Okay. See, so your head's still spinning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, Carl, my wife was talking to me while I was reading this and she said like nine things to me and I just kind of looked at my phone and then she looked at me and she said, you know, tapped me on the head like, did you hear anything I said? And I said, hold on a sec, I gotta, I gotta like. Well, and, <laughs> and that's a big band. I mean, every basis point between eight, nine, 10%, that's a big range in math. And in the last 121 years since 1900, when the Dow Jones Industrial Average has an annual finishing total return that all these plans are relying on over time working, I ask you how many times do you think the market landed on any one decimal point between eight and 10%? And I think I said something like 15 or 20. One time. 
That's crazy. That's like we're building our future when we're not working based off of I don't know what one divided by 121 is, but the odds there of that working out are so small that I think right out right out of the gate it's not going to work. And, and one thing you said that I think is important to talk about as well is those 30 years in your period in you know in your report that you've made a lot of friends with bond rates were significantly higher than they are now. Uh, yields right now, if you've got a portfolio of 60, 30, 10, or 60, 40, which is 60% stock and 40 or 30% in bonds, the yield on that is 20% of what it used to be 30 years ago, maybe a little bit less. So with returns being lower, and we're still saying you can pull 4%, like this is just a recipe for disaster. I mean, this is this is scary stuff because all plans are based on this and it's not the right way to think about it. Now, are we ready for some good news? <laughs> As I packed up my things, when I left, I didn't leave the industry thinking there's no way to do this. I left because I thought there is a better way to do this. So when we opened our firm that we are now merged in partners and I opened it in 2006. Um, I just thought that the question needed to be asked differently. I didn't think I had a better answer and there wasn't going to be something invented. As we've said, there's not a single investment product. And believe me, there will be more Frankenstein funds invented to try to make people feel better about this changing math. When reality is you want to strip out all those manufactured products and stick with the only core ingredients that have been around for more than a hundred years is the only place I have any of my own personal money. So the good news in my opinion, and again, I just stick to the facts or the math and the people that we are so fortunate and blessed to serve and the inspiration. I always think of a couple of examples of what's behind the freedom day before we get into the math and where it comes from, you got to reframe the question. And I think where most of the dysfunction and all this whole behavioral, economics and the psychology of investing and all these books and industries that this dysfunction has given right. <laughs> birth to. Um, and, and I've always wondered, um, you know, wh wh why isn't there books on behavioral plumbing? Like, wh 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 what, what, what is so messed up? I, I don't, I want to find a plumber who knows what he's doing. And, and I'm not trying to figure out <laughs> or, or outguess it or come in there. So I think we cause a lot of these problems ourselves and it's what we expect from the market, whether it be the eight, nine, 10% or whatever the number is, what we expect from investment. That's what I'm going to base. That's what I'm entitled to retire on, or I'm going to build my life around or perversely, if you've already built your life and expectations around something that you're not there, then it gets even more upside down. And I think you have to be willing to adjust and best trade I think you could ever make in any part of life, including the markets, is trading expectations for more appreciation. So the story I always think about with Freedom Day is extreme examples where the investments were not different. The choices of how to live and where to live were very different, which I think is a wildly underestimated piece of Freedom Day versus retirement. You can move, <laughs> you can change, you can either reduce expenses or you can increase them. This is not about living on canned meat. This is about figuring out at some point, if I achieve this amount of income from multiple streams, my mailbox money, what is that for me? How much is enough? Well, I get to decide. So the extreme example is we have somebody that requires all of almost seven figures of income just to maintain the lifestyle. And he's not hanging from a chandelier. He's not smoking cigars, he's not traveling the world, he's just an aggressive giver, which is one of the reasons we agreed to do that extreme of a plan. You require that much income, you gotta have a big nest egg. There's no magic here. We're not, again, we're not making hopes and predictions and appreciation. He has the nest egg to provide those multiple streams, which we'll talk about. On the other end of the expect spectrum, there's a guy that we serve that lives on $9 a day like a king on the Pacific Ocean 
and a couple of fish tacos, a cold cerveza, and a tremendous tribe of friends, he's healthier than this other guy. And actually, you say, who's got it better? The only reason I know that is because they happen to be brothers. So this can be done a lot of different ways, and it's not the investment part. That's where I think we get this upside down. So Freedom Day first involves establishing what my needs and wants are, expenses. And then it's just a matter of how long do I want to work? How much do I need to save so that one day those income streams, both from risk-free and one must be rising, our favorite of all mailbox money, dividends, exceed those expensive. And that day, no matter what the age is, is your freedom day. I think that's a really important thing to talk about too, because a lot of people will say, you know, you can't retire till 67 or 68 or 70 when you can maximize certain benefits or whatever. But you're in charge of the ship, right? You, you get to paint and, and decide what life you want to live, and then you can back into the math, and you might be able to achieve your Freedom Day much, much earlier than people anticipate. But that's fine. And if you want to have seven figures and give a lot and live that type of lifestyle, then we know based on the math and what we can calculate that you need to have a bigger nest egg, which will require a little bit more work. And, and it's important because in the financial community, you kind of have two sides, like work as far as you can, save as much money as you can and, and retire, live your life for 30 years and then you're done. Or retire at 40. Um, and what we're saying is it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can, you get to decide and we'll help you back into the math and tell you when you've got your freedom day. So. It's when the income from multiple sources exceeds the year expenses. You've arrived at your freedom day. So I think it's important that we kind of talk about some of those income and, and, and sources of income, one of which being mailbox money and di rising dividends we'll talk about. But let's, let's just kind of jump into what we're talking about when we talk about income sources and why it's important to think about each one of these independently. So the first requirement is multiple sources. So I would push back strongly with anybody, no matter how well thought out, smart, or fortunate they may have been in one area, whether it be stocks, bonds, real estate, venture, any number of different, if that is your source of income, no matter how safe you think it is, you will not have the peace of mind of true freedom day. And there's absolutely risk there. And we already talked about risk-free income I guess you could have enough to put in one and a half percent T-bills and not need any of these episodes. And if you do, that's great. You don't have to subscribe. <laughs> Others, I, I might want to, and I'm included, of how do I balance those lower yielding but completely risk-free sources of income? And there's only a couple different flavors. I would listen to the Am I Gonna Be Okay episode. We go in deep on them. And then a key is for some folks that think, I'm, I do have enough safe streams. It's balanced. I don't want to take any risk at all. I would push back on them too because you've got to have at least one stream that can not only significantly outpace inflation, I'm assuming you also have a family counting on you for these decisions, so a lot of different expenses, but also for unplanned expenses that are not fixed. We've seen six-figure healthcare scares that come up where you want to be able to afford. So the, the, with 200 plus year track record, unquestionably the best source for that stream of income that is rising every year are dividends. So there is risk of principle that those stock prices will go up or down if you needed them back immediately or over a short period of time, which is exactly why we wouldn't use any scare, safe money in that sacred so it will never be scared but those dividends over time and i know what you get most excited about and all you need anybody is the back of an envelope to do it is oh my gosh just after four or five years or seven or eight years our, our yield on cost for this mailbox money is six seven eight ten percent and rising you get enough of that along with the lower yielding but completely risk-free streams um and you've got something you've got a blend and if folks don't have 
a corporate pension as they are going away. We believe in another form of insured, just like insured bonds and tax-free municipal bonds, you can have personal pensions. So all of those, and Social Security applies there too, no matter what people think about that. That is a source of income that is significant for folks. You wanna optimize it, you wanna have help planning all of these and sequencing them. When do I turn each one of these streams on? In which account, knowing the rules, which is most tax efficient, um, all of those friction points can add considerably to your net income. And when that exceeds all of your costs, needs and wants, with a contingency bucket of cash, that's Freedom Day. So the, the question is, how long do we plan for? Like, like, you know, life expectancy gets into this a lot. Um, you know, I might have enough now, but what happens if I live forever? You know, if I'm really healthy and part of my retirement plan is exercising and eating good food and being in the sun and all that, and all of a sudden I'm living into my 90s. You know, how do you talk, how do you think about or frame time in the sense of like, you need income for how long? And what's the best way to think about that? Well, you know how we think about it because you can always get a big grin and our building of all the pictures of all the different grindexers when people say, how do I index? What do I measure? What's the benchmark? Our only benchmark is 100. And we used to get a little more pushback and snickers. Now we don't. Now we get overwhelmed. For people that say, I don't want to live till 100. Now we get overwhelming gratitude because the worst thing that happens is you end up with a little extra and you don't. Um, there's another example, though, as mathletes ourselves, where you really get deep on the average life expectancy is also extremely misleading. That counts folks from the time they're born until the time they pass away, when the reality is if you're a healthy couple at 65, the odds are very high that at least one of you is gonna live into your 90s. So that average number all of a sudden is completely meaningless, which is an important factor in planning especially since healthcare costs aren't exactly average at that time as they are throughout life. So our benchmark is 100. One, at least one of the two, if it's a married couple, we want to be able to look in the eye and say, your multiple sources of income, your mailbox money that you're not going to have to work for, you're going to receive in your mailbox, you're going to be able to hold it in your hand and know it's real, goes to at least the age of 100, showing them to the number exactly and anybody can do this we're certainly glad to help but if you're not projecting the stock market you're not adding appreciation you're not adding any of the upside but just focusing on the income you can calculate that and some people say that's too conservative why would you want to do that i would i love that problem to have because any appreciation if it's pure gravy so what do we want to do extra now that we're not relying on from freedom day that's where the grindex pictures come from I, so I think that there's a there's a blog post he wrote. Tell me what the title. Two eighty five. The the um, Yogi Berra math. Yeah, the Yogi Berra math. That I think is really important because you, you dissect market returns, dividends, growth rates, all that, and you back into math that you can be comfortable with, right? That you can rely on, and you build your plan around something that. Fine, call it conservative. That's great because if we get it wrong to the conservative side, well, you're smiling a whole lot more, but we know we've got data and we know we've got multiple sources of income and you're gonna be okay, right? Um, I think that that gets into the point of planning is greater than or better than predicting. And every plan that is created is based on math and based on numbers we're confident in, not on 30 years of returns and ignoring sequence of returns and, and that, that huge, huge underappreciated risk. So I think it's important to say you've got to be diligent in your planning. You've got to have multiple sources. Push back on that if you've just gotten one. But once you build this robust portfolio of different sources of income, pension, social security, right, dividends, um, greater than your expenses, and we're not talking just your cost of living, right? You frame this so elo eloquently every time. It's your wants, your desires, everything. We package it in so that you've got enough income here 
until age 100, we can show you on paper, now you're at your freedom day. Now you're secure and now you can answer the question. Well, that simple 285 math, I, I like to share because anybody can do it on the back of their own envelope. A 2% dividend yield growing at 8% a year in eight years will yield you on your principal 5% and growing if the market goes nowhere. And guess what? You just have created a piece of a plan that answers questions that no 4% withdrawal rate of principal and hope for appreciation can ever solve in the simplest way. And if you, if you do believe in balance and having multiple streams first, then what it allows you to do and what I know you get most excited about and where you spend a lot of our time is whatever's left over, speculate and take as much risk as you want to with completely unconstrained upside. This notion that planning and discipline is somehow limiting the exact opposite is true. It is liberating. That's important. I think you get the plan built. You're allowed to explore fun things. You can spend all your money. You can invest it into whatever individual stock or crypto or whatever opportunity comes your way. If you get it wrong, you've got the math, you know, backing you up. You know, your coach in the corner telling you you're going to be okay because you went out and threw a haymaker and dropped your left hand and got clocked, right? But if you get it right, you're just that much happier. And so it's 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 not limiting, it it's empowering. And I think that that's the way you have to frame this, and that's the way that we try to talk about this: is you get your base built, then you're free to explore. But if you go, get lost or make a bad choice or the market doesn't do what you think it did or what we think it's going to do in these growth assets, you're still going to be okay because you've got math, you've got a plan, you're diligent, goes to 100, planning for your spouse, you've got your freedom day. So that that to me is really, really important. And I think it's also important to know that everybody can frame this for themselves. And it's not cookie cutter. It's not one plan is the best. It, it's independent of what you want to do for your life and your desires. And you're the captain of this. You get to build it. And then we get to help you put the numbers together and create a plan. So yeah. Walked out of Wall Street, two questions, two signs you were holding, worked out for you. <laughs> Seems like it. <laughs> it only took me 10 years of several thousand questions to learn that were not important. And then everything else can truly be viewed as the distraction that it is if you answer those two questions. How do I know I'm going to be okay? How much is enough? And we're going to share every tool in our kit to, to hopefully help anybody answer those questions in their own way and, and we'll, ha we'll be happy to answer questions if we can help. I love that and if you guys have any questions like I say as always please just drop a question below we'll get back to you uh, reach out if you've got any questions or if you want help with us guiding you along the way we'd love to work for you and if you subscribe if you like this that would also be very great. So I think that's it we'll see you guys next time. This show is brought to you by Freedom Day Solutions, LLC, a registered investment advisory firm advising individuals and families nationwide. Performance is not guaranteed and past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. To learn more, visit freedomdaysolutions.com. This show contains general information that is not suitable for everyone and was shared for informational purposes only. Any forward-looking statement or opinion expressed is subject to change without notice. Nothing contained herein constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice nor is it to be relied on in making investment or other decisions. Clients of Freedom Day Solutions may hold positions in the securities discussed.